Well, good morning, good morning. What a beautiful worship this morning. Andre, I really love your worship. It really, really gets me going, and my spiritual juices just flow with worship. Just amazing. I love it. <laughs> well, good morning to everyone that is here and everyone via Zoom. Good morning. Today, I wanted to share a Bible story with you, and I wanted to share with you a little bit about something that God has put in my heart. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about who Jesus is to us, and I wanted to share the this perspective of who Jesus is through a Bible story that I wanted to share with you this morning. This Bible story has been very fascinating to me because it really helps to confront present reality. So, this Bible story that I want to share with you uh, confronts present reality. If we can just turn to the scripture from, we're going to take, if we can have the next slide, please. I don't have my little nice clicker, but it's okay, I don't have to be in control all the time. Okay, <clears throat> so it's taken from the book uh, of Luke, um, chapter 8 and verse 26. It is a story that often, you know, I haven't often got to share in preaching, but, you know, but a lot of us are aware of this story. But I want to take the time to read it to you and really share with you a little bit some of the things that are very interesting about this Bible story, which is actually something that took place. So, you know, this story, just give you the little intro to the story, it takes place after Jesus demonstrated his power over nature. He calmed the storm right before this story is explained by Luke. Um, uh, so he... He, gave, he talked to his disciples. He, um, he shared a few parables about what the heart of the Father is. Then he comes the storm. And then we come to this story. Let's pick it up from verse 26. They sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is across from Galilee. When he stepped out on land, a man from the city who had demons for a long time met him. He wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice, said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I plead with you, do not torment me. That's a good way to start ministry, right? After having a beautiful time of just walking. Uh, just calming a storm. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. It often had seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. But he broke the shackles and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Let's just pause there for a minute, just to, to look at what's really happening Jesus had just demonstrated he had authority over nature. He was able to calm the storm. Now, Jesus, well, one of the things that Jesus did that was a success to his ministry is, remember I to told you about just simmering, pickling, staying in his presence. So Jesus spent a lot of time hours, a lot of time um, alone with the Father in his presence. So when he came out of being, you know, alone with the Father and he was with the crowds, really what oozed out of him was just the very essence, the fragrance, and, and who the Father was, was just like on Jesus, in Jesus. You know, Jesus walked and, you know, everybody who encountered Jesus really encounter the heart of the Father. 
So it was one of those moments that, you know, he, he did the miracle, he, he calmed the storm, and then he comes to a country that was primarily, it, it was across from the Sea of Galilee. It was a, a city that was primarily ge- um, inhabited by Gentiles because the Decapolis was there, another city, and it was primarily a Gentile city, which is why they, there was an, um, I'll tell you later why, but let's just put a pause on that. So now Jesus steps out of the, uh, on, on land from, from the boat, and he was greeted by a man who was overcome by demonic spirits. And Jesus had a direct confrontation with the enemy. First, he has a direct confrontation with something that's happening in nature, with a storm. He confronts the storm, and storm has no chance. Storm stops. So here, again, he confronts, he has a direct face-to-face confrontation with a man that's possessed with demons. So he had demons for a long time. So much so that he wore no clothes, and he didn't live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, verse 28, and fell down before him with a loud voice said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Did you come here to torment me? You know, in this confrontation... It's not a battle of equals. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't have to do anything but just stand and really assert who he is. All Jesus has to do is be Jesus. And then the the enemy is really not a threat to the Lord. So not only that, but the enemy knows a lot about Jesus. He knows who he is. He knows his function. He even goes goes as far as to say, well, did you come here to torment me? Uh, Mark also um, describes this parable. And in the book of Mark, it says, you know, have you come to mess with us before a time? So the enemy knows that there is judgment. And the enemy knows that his time is limited, that he will be forever cast into the abyss, and the spirits really want to possess, and, you know, they know that Jesus can do whatever he wants. It often amazes me how the devil and all his demons are so aware of the authority that that God has, so much so that if we really understood what the enemy understands, Wow, how much of an eye-opening that would be. Um, <clears throat> one time I was in a deliverance and uh, session. <clears throat> you used to make this with appointments back then. And, and then um, as I was confronting the evil spirit in front of me, <laughs> you know, the spirit looked at me and said, you, you Christians are so stupid. You don't know the authority you carry. <laughs> said, uh, first of all, I'm thinking, don't disrespect me like that. And second of all, you talk too much, you know. So, but guess what? That spirit was right. It was a very chatty spirit, but was very right. <laughs> Looked at me and said, you're stupid. You don't know what the authority has. I was thinking, thanks for letting me know. Your time's up now. You can go. But, you see, it's not really a battle between equals. Why did the Spirit say that to me? Well, why did that Spirit say that to Jesus? The Spirit said, hey, did you come here to torment me? It's amazing to me how the evil spirits are so evil they can't help themselves but to confess what's true. Because, see, it's not a battle of equals. So there is a direct confrontation when the enemy sees the superiority of the authority that Jesus has 
over him. So he can't help himself but to say that. It really amazes me that if we understood the truth as the enemy understands the truth, then um, the truth could set us free. You know, uh, um, my son Aaron goes, well, mom, you know, why can't the devil repent? You know, I said, I don't know. Take it up with God, Aaron. I, I can't, you know. Well, why, why can't he just become a good guy? I said, I don't know. He had a chance, but, you know, then I had to introduce to him the, the issue of free will. I said, you know, he had his chance. He chose not to. Well, why can't he repent? I said, well, he had his time to repent. So now there's judgment. So that's that with, with that debate there. But look at that. The enemy, the demons say, do not torment me. So <coughs> the demons understood that Jesus had the power to do what he pleased with the enemy. And do we understand that Jesus has this power to do what he pleases? Some Christians say, yeah, I understand that Jesus has the power to do what he, what he pleases. But the problem is sometimes the debate in our mind is, what does he really please? What really pleases Jesus? And I want to show you a little bit his heart through this, this parable. Because what amazes me about this parable is not just the superiority of his authority and his power. Uh, he doesn't even debate with the enemy. He doesn't, he doesn't yell. I don't I, I imagine he just, he doesn't go, in other words, Jesus is not going into a screaming match with the enemy. Get out! I, he's not, he doesn't say that, you know. He could. But what my point is, it's not a battle. It's not a, he amazes me that Jesus does not get into a power struggle with the enemy. How many times do we as Christians get into power struggles? I found out something very interesting about power struggles. People who get into power struggles is because they're not convinced of how powerful they really are. So have you ever gotten into a power struggle with your teenager or with anyone? You know, sometimes my clients like to get into power struggles with me. Um, I've had a few of those. Um, one time a client said to me, well, there's many occasions, but I give you these examples just to tell you how we minister out of this freedom and the authority that God has given us. You know, well... I like the smart ones because I like to, to always debate and to always like challenge and, you know, have this person, you know, who, you know, went to law school, very good debater, very good lawyer type law school debater, who debated me about my observations. So he said to me, well, you know, I realized that in our last session we battled between logic. I said, I'm not battling with you. I said, why am I going to battle with you? I'm not depressed. You're depressed. I said, I'm just observing what you're telling me. And I said, another thing, I said, why does my opinion really matter to you so much? What I think doesn't really matter because I'm not depressed. You are. What's really interesting here is what you think. I said, I'm not battling for who's smarter or whose opinion is. I said, I'm just making observations of what I'm seeing. I said, if you don't like what I'm observing, why don't you tell me what you think? Besides, we're here to examine your thoughts, not mine. Remember, you came to me because you're depressed. So, so my thoughts don't matter. Let's look at yours. So I'm not battling. I'm not fighting. What am I fighting for? I'm not trying to change my depression I'm trying to help. So I'm saying this because Jesus has nothing to fight for because he operates out of a position of authority. Out of a position. The issue of authority is already settled in his mind. 
See, when you go out to do ministry, whether it is you preach the gospel, you heal the sick, whether it is you confront the enemy one-on-one, -on -one, right? You don't debate for your, your, your power and authority. You're, you go there because you're convinced. And if you're not convinced, you know, you get convinced down the road that you have power. One way or another, you're convinced. I remember when I first started to, to operate in the ministry of deliverance, you know, the enemy was like, well, now it's worse. Now where there's more in us. Now we're worse. And I believed it. So sure enough, when I went to my, to my pastor, he said, oh, boy, they just pulled one on you. Because the more I tried to get the lady f set free, the worse she was getting. So we were like having a, a, a war. <laughs> tag you it, tag you it. You know, finally I got tired. I went back. The pastor said, well, there was one way to learn. What's to fight with, Kayla? The power's already yours. Why are you listening? So, you know, then after a few times we're her hearing, well, I'm, you know, you know I'm going to hurt you. You know I'm going to do this to you. You know I'm going to do that to you. It's only a problem if you believe it. In the first few times I believed it, and I tried a few tricks that I knew. It's only because I wasn't convinced. So what I'm saying is here we are as Christians, we're being confronted with things. And the more we react is because the more we're not convinced. But the reason why we are not convinced is because oftentimes we're not convinced of who Jesus is in us. And that's why my title is, Who is Jesus to You? Because you only fight for something you're not sure you have. But Jesus knew who he was. He, Jesus knew who the Father was. So no matter what confrontation we're having, when you're reacting, tag, you're it. The joke's on you oftentimes, even from the enemy. Because you fight for something you not, may not be convinced. And oftentimes, the church fights gets into these power struggles, uh, into these conflicts. Why? Because the issue is oftentimes not settled in our, in our hearts of who Jesus is. But guess what? You know, even starting out in ministry and just being confronted with a lot of different characters, you know, and being threatened... <laughs> I had one lady in my office, you know, her, you know, she came with from marital counseling. The husband, very abusive to her, verbally, emotionally, the whole nine yard. So, uh, so I was reflecting on the husband's statements. So the husband said, obviously, this is a stupid counselor. We need to get up and leave. So... He turns to his wife and he tells her, I don't want you to listen to her. I can't believe I wasted my money and my time for this counseling. This is, this is worthless. Something like that. So, but the problem, he was not really the problem, to be honest with you. You know, he was actually being honest with what he felt about me. The problem was that his wife was my main client. The problem was her will. She came to me because she was very anxious, depressed. She wanted to be set free. But she wasn't convinced about who she was and about who her husband was. So she came to me for help. So I said, well, won't you come with your husband? You know, we need to get to the bottom of this. So then when, when he voiced his opinion and I reflected on what he was saying. He didn't like it. But the problem wasn't him. The problem was her. What she would believe. Would she believe that I was a stupid, worthless counselor that lied about what I was observing? Or would she believe her abuser, husband? She sat in my couch. She had a choice to make. Will I believe this counselor who has no reason to lie? I'm paying her for him. Mean, or would I believe this man that is verbally, emotionally abusing me and ripping me apart in front of 
this counselor. And you know what happened? Fear kept her back. She was so afraid of being alone. She was so afraid of living alone without the man that she loved so much. She looked at me. I looked at her and I said, well, this is what your husband said. What's your opinion? She said, well, she said, um, I have to listen to what he's saying. So then the husband said, come on, we need to go. Get her up. Gets her up from the couch, walking out. He turns to me. He says, don't you ever talk to my wife again. He threatened me. He said, if I hear that you talk to my wife, we're going to have a problem. I turned to his wife, not to him, because he was never my threat. I turned to his wife and I said to her, out loud in front of him so he can hear me. I said to her, if you ever need me, you know where to find me. Grabbed her. He just rushed it out of the office. He, she looked at me, knowing that I was saying the truth. But she was too afraid to listen to the truth. You know what happens in a case like this? She goes back to her husband. He abuses her a little bit more until she can't live with it anymore. And then she needs an emergency counseling and emergency help, which, you know, God is loving. He gets it. But why am I giving you this example? The problem is never the devil. The problem is never the one who does the abuse. The problem is the will. Marisol shared earlier about B, S, is, is, to surrender the S and the B was my soul, the, the brokenness. That woman was broken, but what was the problem? The problem was the will. My soul shared that. The will was not surrendered. That woman came to me because she needed freedom for um, anxiety and depression. She was actually a victim of abuse. She needed help. Help was very readily available to her. But the problem is she, has, she had a will. People always have a will. People have free will. She had to choose to either listen to my reflections of what I was seeing or she had to listen to her abuser. I couldn't set that woman free. I couldn't even minister to her. I couldn't pray for her. I couldn't talk to her. Why? Because she chose to she chose to bow down to fear. Her will was not given over to truth. So there's nothing I could do. The only thing I could do was pray for her. Do you understand? So the enemy is not really the biggest uh, bully here. Why? Because you realize the enemy can't bully Jesus. Why? Because he was for, forever settled in his identity. But look at how the story goes on. I, you look at this, this for, for, for a moment. Uh, verse 29. He had he, so he had commanded the, un the unclean spirit to come out. Um, and then when he commanded the spirit to come out, the spirit said, man, you really came to torment me. Because he knew. His time was limited. He knew judgment was coming. He knew a lot of things. And he says, man, what, what do you have to do with me, Jesus? We already know that you have power, and I, I don't. I know it. You know it. Why? The issue was settled. But guess what? Look at the power that spirit had on that man. He often had seized, seized him. He was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. But guess what? That man was bound with chains and shackles because he was out of his mind. He was sleeping in the tombs. He didn't have a house. He didn't wear clothes. And the spirit was so powerful inside of him that actually he would break the chains and break the shackles. Moral of the story, don't ever fight a demon You physically. <laughs> You won't win. 
you fight with authority. Don't ever pick fights like that. You know, just with one word, the chains are broken. So I'm saying this to say, um, oftentimes in the church and in ministry, we try to do things that were already done. So all we need to do is speak with authority because we have this settled of identity, the issue of identity settled in us. So that's what Jesus did, you know. Um, I'm sure the mercy ministry and, and the caring ministry took care of all the, you know, clothed them and all that. But something needs to be settled here, right? And what, what needs to be settled is the battle is not between equals. And I want to say this to you as we were worshiping earlier. The Lord spoke to me and he said to me, you know, tell my people that there are fruits that are ripe and ready to pick up in their lives, and some of them their lives, but they haven't done it so. Um, and what I saw was that for some of you, your breakthrough has come. And your breakthrough is like the big, juicy, ripe cherry on a cherry tree. We used to have cherry a cherry farm in Greece. I know what it looks like when it's ready, ripe, and ready to come up to, to, to be picked. So I saw in my spirit that for some of you, the fruit is ripe, is ready to be picked, but you haven't picked it yet. And the Lord told me to tell you, go pick up the fruit because it's ripe. It's your breakthrough. Is the, is the result of your prayers is the result of you stood by faith, you fought the good fight of faith, it's ripe, but you haven't picked it up, you haven't claimed it. It's kind of like Amazon send you a package and you never pick it up. And that's what I saw in my spirit for some of you. You prayed, you believed for your breakthrough, all you have to do is just go pick it up. Pick up that ready fruit. Pick up that ready, the thing that the Lord has given you, your breakthrough. And the Lord told me to remind you, pick up your present. Pick up your breakthrough. Pick up the readiness of that which you've prayed for. Because what good is it if it's ripe, if it's ready, all you have to do is just now reach out and take the small risk of reaching, reaching out to pick it up. But you may say, well, what, what does that look like practically? This is what it may look like. Maybe someone you've been praying for a long time and you haven't had this, this, this moment of come to Jesus moment or just to say, hey, you know, I've been ministering to you for a long time. For some of you, that, that's the time for you to go demand in a nice, meek, gentle, and firm way, demand the result of your ministry. The result of your prayer. Don't be afraid. Right? And that's what I feel that this, this is something that I wanted to share with you. That the Lord, the Lord said, you know, I've given them the breakthrough. They just, they have not, uh, they have not um, acted out on it. They haven't talked to that person. They haven't um, really um, picked up what, what's freely theirs. Right, so um, so this guy was so demonized that he was driven by the demon into the wilderness. So you can see the power that this oppression had on this poor man. Let's let's uh, look at verse thirty. If we can go to the next slide and look at verse thirty. Jesus asked him, "What is your name?" He said, "Legion," because many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to go out into the abyss. There was a large herd of swine feeding on the mountain. They begged him to permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and reported it in the city and in the country. 
Then they went out to see what happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how he who had been possessed by demons was healed. What a, mar what a remarkable story. So Jesus encounter. here's the thing, he encountered the head of the rank, you know, because, you know, the demonic rel realm is very well organized with rankings, you know, principalities, authorities. So the, the number one rank man was Legion because he had a lot of foot soldiers that he was commanding them. So he went straight to the head and said, hey, what's your name? And then what happened is he didn't resist Jesus. The enemy will not resist your authority. The enemy will try in the beginning, but he will not resist your authority. He didn't resist his authority. He gave him his name. Here's the thing that I marvel about Jesus. I looked at the way he did miracles, and I, looked at, I look at his miracles often because the miracles always point out to his heart. Every miracle that Jesus did was a demonstration of the heart of the Father. And this is a remarkable demonstration of power and meekness. Power and meekness. What was the meekness in this? The demon knew the number one higher ranking in, in that, um, that life, knew that Jesus had the power to send him to the abyss. He knew that Jesus could do whatever he wanted. Jesus said, okay, I will send you somewhere else. Jesus is not a bully. He, he was not a bully with his enemies. He didn't bully the demon. But the demon had a perfect surrender. How amazing it would be if we surrender to Jesus the way demons surrender to him. It was not a, a, a war back and forth. It was not um, a fight of resistance. But there was a perfect surrender. There was a perfect fear, the and fear and respect that the enemy, the demons had towards Jesus. So oftentimes, you know, some of my colleagues that, you know, they do counseling, they say, oh, man, there's one thing I don't want to ever deal with is just the, dar the, the, the darkness. I'm thinking, first of all, you're dealing with darkness whether you want to, you know, admit it or not. But I said, second of all, I oftentimes ask people, who would you rather deal with, a demon or the will of man? I'd rather deal with a demon than a will of man because the demon always obeys me. And it's not cockiness. It's truth. It's my birthright. It's the blood of Jesus. I don't have to fight a demon. So I often tell people, the, the, the demon always obeys you. But the will of man doesn't. Why? Because people have free choices, free will. Right? Now, what happens? There's perfect obedience. There was a perfect understanding. Demons have to obey you. They have no choice. And they know that. Do you? They know they have no choice because they know the right that was given to you. They know the blood of Jesus. Demons know it. Principalities know it. They know they have to obey you. As long as you know your authority. As long as you know whose you are. As long as you know the issue of who Jesus is and who you are in him is settled in you. As long as you understand. People don't have to obey you. 
Why? They have free will. Now, imagine how meek, how sweet, how gentle, and how gracious Jesus is. He tells Legion, go ahead, go to the swine. He deserved to go to the abyss. He sent him to the, to the swines. But another remarkable thing here is that what happened is that there was a reaction that has to do with the will of man. And here's the reaction. People who fed the herd and they tended to the herd, they went to the city and they told, you know, what happened. I'm sure they told the, the people that owned the whole, swine, the whole herd of the swine, they said, listen, business is not looking very good today. We lost all of our income. These are mostly Gentiles. That's why they had the herd in that city. So, and here comes the will of man. People saw what happened. They saw, and actually it says very clearly that verse 36, those who had seen it told them how he who had been possessed by demons was healed. So here's the thing that amazes me. They went and told everyone in the city and in the country how this man who was out of his mind, naked, terrorized the whole city. Nobody wanted to deal with him. God healed and in his right mind. And that's a reaction that boggles my mind. The people were afraid. Can we have the next slide? So there was a miracle that took place. And people were afraid. Then the whole crowd from the surrounding country of the gatherings asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he went into the boat and returned. I just want to pause there. So what happened is the people asked Jesus, please leave. We don't want any trouble here. Please go. What kind of a mindset is that? You don't want any trouble? You had legions of demons. There was a naked man that was terrorizing everyone. You couldn't, you couldn't go past him. You had to change uh, road if you, came, if you ran across him. You don't want any trouble? What was going on in their mind? I tell you, it is the most tragic thing to encounter Jesus to encounter his heart, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his miraculous power, his authority, and to be succumbed with fear. Were they supposed to be afraid of Jesus? They should have been afraid of the legion, and they were. But in comparison, legion, Jesus. Legion, Jesus. You would think the choice would be easy, right? The will of man is free. You can't do anything. What did Jesus do? Did he do like, let's call fire to come down like Peter John had suggested before? Again, we show, Jesus shows his heart. He listened to them. We want you to leave. We don't want any trouble here. We're scared. Leave. Jesus says, okay, I'm going to leave. You know, if you read on to the, the rest of the chapters of this gospel, you know, Jesus then goes to his hometown, and he does a few miracles, but not a lot. I'm sharing this with you guys because this is what I want to get across. Your will, your opinion of Jesus matters is the difference between your freedom and your oppression is the difference between what you will possess and what you will not possess it's a difference between what how you're going to live and how you're going to to influence those around you 
This issue of who Jesus is has to be settled. And I know that oftentimes there are so many miracles that take place. Do you know I have prayed and I have seen a lot of people who got healed right in my office. I've seen demons leaving from people right in my office many times. Do you know many times people don't benefit from it? They don't take advantage of it. Why? Because they have the will that needs to be surrendered. Is exactly what Marisol, she hit the nail on the head. I really feel that God is telling us, I want you to surrender your will to me. I want you to be, to be of an open, humble, meek, and broken heart to surrender my will. You know why? Because there's been many miracles that the Lord has done, I see, in many of our lives. Let's take advantage to remember the heart of God through these miracles. Because if not, what happens is, whatever preoccupied you before the miracle it tends to get worse. And I'm not saying this to scare you. It's very simple and practical. I like simple and practical things. Remember how Jesus says, when the Spirit comes out of a man, and the Spirit sees the place clean and swept up, comes back to check it out, it's clean, swept up. Now he brings seven other more evil spirits or more wicked spirits. Oftentimes people say, oh, I don't want to do deliverance because there's going to be more spirits. I'm like... Relax. It's all a matter of will. Once we do the right counseling, we'll have that taken care of. Do you want more spirits? Oh, God, no, I don't. Okay, well, just listen. You don't have to freak out about this. But what is this about? It's about this, guys. When you pray and when you trust God and God does a miracle, a breakthrough in your life, and you don't take advantage of it and understand who Jesus is, in its place will come worse unbelief in your life. How? Because if you don't understand the heart of the Father through the miracle, through the breakthrough, if you become complacent, if you do not surrender to who Jesus is, unbelief will inhabit that place. Because the enemy is going to come back and knock on your door. And if you don't allow the breakthrough you received so far in your life, the miracle you received so far in your life, if you don't understand it, if you don't understand the heart of God, the enemy is going to come and check it out. Say, well, Jesus healed you back then, so what? And if you don't have this issue settled of who Jesus is, guess what's going to happen? Unbelief will come in. And that issue that was like that, it will become worse. Why? Because you haven't allowed the breakthrough and the miracle to transform your heart. Every time God performs a miracle, there is a responsibility on my behalf and on your behalf to learn the heart of the Father and to replicate that into the world and to demonstrate it. And when we don't, unbelief comes in. And next time someone tells you about a miracle, you become like, oh, no, I've seen that before. Then nothing happens. And it becomes worse. Because now you're even more unbroken. um, You have more of a complacent heart. And Jesus says, with a complacent heart, I can't do anything. The lady that walked out of my office choosing to live with the abuser instead of believing what I said to her, I spend hours and hours and hours of counseling, speaking to her the truth, why she has no right to be abused, why people shouldn't talk to her like that, her self-worth, a whole nine yards. She took a look at me and she said, Kayla, I don't want to live without this man. I'm scared To find out who I am. I'm scared to take a risk to find out who Jesus is in my life. She walked right out with a man that would beat the life and hell out of her. 
she chose not to. I am sure soon enough there will come a day when she'll be like, I'm tired of being beaten up. But it doesn't have to come to that. It doesn't have to come. It ha does not ha have to, to become seven times worse. Why am I sharing with you this message today? Miracles are important. Everything that Jesus demonstrates is important. Everything he does is important. Every breakthrough is important. Why? Because you're supposed to come very close in sync with his heart. Surrender or learn. God's miracles, God's power, God's authority have the purpose to consume you with who Jesus is. And when they don't, unbelief comes in. Complacency comes in. And then you become harder to for God to break through and to mold and to use. Do you understand? Let's stand. I'm going to ask you to participate in an encounter with Jesus today. And I'm going to ask you to become intentional and very conscious of his presence in your life. And the kind of miracle miracles that he performed in your life. And the kind of breakthrough you have seen. Because the Lord is waiting for the right response. Will it be a response of fear? Or will, will it be a response of unity? Whatever you're afraid of possesses you. Whatever you're afraid of will consume you and will possess you. And Jesus waits for the right response. Close your eyes. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will bring to our remembrance your works. Bring to our remembrance our breakthroughs, the miracles that you have done for us on a personal level, on a corporate level. Remind us, Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about what he has done in your life. And thank him. I want you to see what your miracles tell you about Jesus. And I am asking you, who is Jesus to you through these miracles? Take a moment to think, who is Jesus to you? through these miracles, through these breakthroughs. And thank Him. Acknowledge Him. Now I want you to think what Jesus is doing in your life right now, in your heart right now, what miracle is he doing in your life? What is Jesus doing in your life right now? Part ways with fear. Everything that you're preoccupied with 
that scares you. You have a free will to say no to fear. You can choose your thoughts. You cannot choose the thoughts that come to you, but you can choose the thoughts that you will subscribe to. Choose carefully. Every thought that's fearful, not only is it stealing your breakthrough, but is making you oppressed to that very operating spirit of fear. Jesus, who are you in my life now? What are you doing now? I am here now. Are you a victim? Are you abused? Are you neglected? Are you lonely? Are you looked down on? Are you abandoned? Are you forsaken? Are you afflicted with sickness? Are you looked down on? Are you spoken evil of? Are you being condemned? And what is Jesus doing? What are you choosing to believe about who God is in you? And what are you choosing to believe about who you are to him? Can you change? Are you changing? Can Jesus break through to that one thing? That's so challenging. Can you see yourself free where you couldn't before? What do you need to change in you to see that freedom? What are you willing to let go of? And what are you willing to embrace? Because God is talking to you. What are you willing to accept as truth? And what are you willing to expose as a lie in you? I want you to be quiet for just a moment. Don't say anything to the Lord. Just be quiet. Don't even say, you know, thank you, Jesus. Praise Jesus. No, 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 no. Let's just be quiet for just a moment. Holy Spirit, come. And go in deeper, Lord. Your truth is like a sword that separates the bone from the marrow. Is that sharp? Is that precise? Lord, we welcome you to do a deep heart operation. Pray that every heart is open to what the Master wants to do.
What price have you been paying for the fear that you have? And is it worth it? What price have you been paying for your anxiety, for your fear, and for your depression, for your obsession? What price have you been paying? And I'm telling you, it's not worth it. Before you, Lord, every heart is open and naked. There is no masquerading. There is no pretension. There is not even trying to, to look good to you. You love us. You never leave us or forsake us. If you worry that you may not look very good before God, I've got news for you. He already knows you. He loves you anyway. Because he loves who you are. He made you. There is nothing you can hide he doesn't know already. So you might as well not worry about that. It's just you and Jesus. You don't have to look good to him. He is good to you. He loves you. He doesn't look at your weakness with his face turned away. So you might as well surrender. Because he wants to have your heart. Do you know that song that says, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul? I don't know if it's easy to play it or not. I'd like to end with, with that song. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I don't know if that's easy. I don't know, you know. Might as well give him an, a sacrifice of offering our, you know, our praise, our worship ourselves. That's all he wants. Just sing it with me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Door 
feel my soul I live for you alone every breath that I take every moment I'm awake Lord have your Lord I give you Lord I give you my heart and I give you my soul I live for you alone every breath that I to the altar. Prayer partners will be here waiting for you. If not, we bless you and we thank God for what he's doing in your life. Just continue to give it all to him. The altar is open. God bless you, Zoom audience. May you live your life totally and wholly surrendered to him. Thank 
you, Jesus. If you could put some sound on, that'll be good. <laughs> 